I've been listening to your podcast, Funny Because It's True. You're so brilliant. You're natural at the format, first of all. Thank you. And you are engagingly honest. I love how you edit it with like your own, like, <laughs> oh, okay, I should have <laughs> said this part. Because I find myself doing that all the time. Yeah. You have a conversation with someone and you realize as you're editing it, like, I don't know why I did that. And it's too late to communicate that you feel like an idiot. Yes. You're like, I want people to be able to know I'm aware that this was weird. I'll stay awake thinking about what I said or didn't or didn't say, or maybe I glossed over something really heartfelt and the next thing out of my mouth was really trivial. Anywho, super hungry. What are you going to eat for lunch today? You're just, oh, luckily I have like incredible producers who stay pretty close in communication with me because I am a natural interviewer about things that don't matter at all. You know what I mean? I'm like, I don't do the right questions. My college roommate once, I don't think that she was meaning to compliment me, but she did. She was like, you could talk to anybody about their, like, sock drawer. And I totally took that as a compliment. Yeah. Tell me about your sock drawer, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I don't like to really wear socks. I'm just getting into socks right now for the first time in my life. <laughs> Are you joking? No. <laughs> Literally three days ago, got my first, like, new pair of socks that I'm excited about. You live in Nebraska, right? Yeah. I mean, I have some socks, but I've never, like, been a sock person. I will, like, just full, I don't know if I can say this, but raw dog it <laughs> I'm a tube soccer. I'm getting into it. I love them. Do you find that with your podcast, you enjoy talking to people about things that you go off topic? Because that's something that I always really struggle with. I will literally just go down a rabbit hole and stay there for 20 minutes. Do you have producers that are like, stop? <laughs> no, not till after. Oh, good. But no, I think I go down rabbit holes all the time that maybe aren't interesting. I don't know. But I think my bigger hang up is not pulling that thread. Yeah. I wonder about our attention span these days. It's hard. <laughs> Elise, will you tell me about your uh, podcasting journey? Have you been enjoying it? Oh, gosh. It's been a journey. <laughs> like, no one knows the work that goes into something like this before they get into it. Totally. You hear this, like, beautiful thing that you listen to for years, and you're like, how hard could that be? Right. A microphone. And it's only audio. <laughs> right. And so I just wasn't aware. And then I decided to pick one of the hardest formats that isn't just me talking. Like I am interviewing guests and I am very socially uncomfortable in every way. And so I'm like, why did I do that to myself? Like, <laughs> it's like a graded conversation every week. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Was there one in particular that made you feel like you left it feeling insecure? All of them. I go through like the creative process every episode of, you know, I get done with the interview and luckily I have people on chat that will tell me like, that was a great question or like, let's pivot because I am very bad naturally. At, like we're talking about earlier, having a normal conversation that is fun to listen to for other people. But then I get to the end of it and I'm like, that was the worst thing I've ever done. And then the people that are very good at their job take the episode and they edit it and cut it down. And then I get that version back and I'm like, okay, it's good. This wasn't as bad as I remembered it being. And usually it's like the emotions taken out. It's a couple of days later. So you hear it the way other people were hearing it when they were listening. And then I add my VO, which really allows me to make it my own again. So then it goes back into my heart and in my brain and I wrestle with it. And then I give raw audio of my voiceovers back to producers, which feels like you're literally handing over your journal. And that's the worst part because I don't know what they're going to use from that and not. And I will go on long tangents because I don't have anyone there to tell me, hey, stop talking. It's the whole thing. But they're always fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's just a lot. Like I'm very used to writing things out. I'm used to performing them and to give someone a stream of consciousness that they will choose to do with what they think is best. It's a very nerve wracking process that I'm getting more comfortable with as trust builds with my team. But then, yeah, they get it and then they send it back with all the stuff and then we sound design it from there. It's just that process of like, I'm the worst at this to like, okay, this is all right, to this is the best thing I've ever done. The next day you listen to it, you're like, I'm the worst at this. <laughs> it's just a constant like, that's what it is to be a creative person. You're your biggest fan and your worst critic all at the same time. It's a lot, but it's great. <laughs> um, okay, I want to ask you a series of questions. Yeah. Would you consider yourself a good traveler? Yes, I am now. I was not before. Do you enjoy traveling? 
Depends on what it's for. But yeah, I really enjoy the process of getting on a plane and like having a couple hours where nobody really expects anything of me because it just feels like I can just be like, oops, sorry, I'm on the plane. I don't have Wi-Fi. And then I do and I'm like watching Netflix with it. Are you a good traveler in a group? Oh, no. I'm not a good anything in a group. (laughs) I am like not patient, I think. And also I am a problem solver to the max where it's really annoying because if someone says, where do you guys want to eat? And then I give an answer and then there's like 28 other opinions. Uh, And then I will just be like, all right, I'll meet you guys back here. And it's like, that's not the point. Like you're going to literally be with these people. So yeah, not a good traveler in a group. So don't go to Vegas for a (laughs) bachelorette party with Elise. (laughs) No. And it sounds so funny. I'm just very like, there is one way to do it in my brain. That's the only way that makes sense. And I'm just like not a fun person to like travel. with. Well, the reason why I kind of want to explore this idea is because I've never been to Nebraska. Oh. And I haven't really spent that much time in the Midwest in general. I'm not from Nebraska. I moved here in 2017 when my husband and I were dating long distance. I was born in California and I grew up in Anaheim right next to Disneyland. And I literally would like go on my porch and watch the fireworks every night. And that was bedtime after that. So I lived there for like the first 13 years of my life. And then I moved to Long Beach, California and did middle school and high school there. Ah, the best years. Oh yeah, there's the best. (laughs) Would never go back. And I don't wish them on my worst enemy. And then I moved to Paris after that. And then I moved back to the States for a little bit. And then I moved to Australia for three years, which is where I met my husband. And then I (laughs) moved to Texas. And then I moved to Nebraska. Okay, wait a minute. Let's go back. The Paris idea. Yeah. I'm assuming you moved from Anaheim to Long Beach because your parents either had an employment switch or whatever. Are your parents still together? No. So my parents were really never together. By the time I came around, they were like totally split. Okay. I don't know the situation. (laughs) I'm not sure of the logistics of how that happened, honestly. Have you ever asked them about it? Everyone has a million versions. There's no point in really asking questions. I mean, I've tried to understand what happened and why and when with my parents. So I have three older brothers, much older, seven, eight, and 10 years older. And they had a difficult, in a different way, childhood, you know, growing up with parents in the same house. Then when I came, they were older. My parents were split. My dad lived in Long Beach. My mom lived in Anaheim. And I would be going back and forth. No wonder you needed the fireworks. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, just give me these 15 minutes. Lord knows I need it. (laughs) (laughs) Just 10 years old. Just like, give me some time. And uh, yeah, so then we moved to Long Beach because my mom wanted us to not have to go through the back and forth. But also it was a much better school district. And I was really struggling with school. And so she's like, let's just put her in a place that has better schools, I guess. And then I moved to Paris because I did a... (laughs) I did a study abroad and just stayed. I have nothing to go back to, so we're just going to stay. Did you fall in love with it? Yeah, I loved it. I saved so much money because I worked really hard and I just like stockpiled all this money away. What were you working? I, gosh, worked three jobs at one time. I delivered bread in the morning. I worked at a restaurant in the afternoon and then I was a cater waiter at night and I would get like four hours of sleep. I'd sleep in my my car sometimes. I started working when I was like 16, but when I turned 18, it was like this idea that for my whole life, people had been making decisions for me that were awful decisions, you know, that I would never go back and choose those for myself. And it was like the first time I really felt like I can do anything I really want to do. And most people will turn to like experiencing freedom in one way where they're having fun and going to parties. And I genuinely went the other way where I was like, I'm going to become a working adult (laughs) because I wanted to have security that I just didn't have as a kid. What was your relationship with your siblings like? They were my best friends and also like my parents. It was a weird relationship where like we were each other's everything, but I wasn't able to give them what they gave me because I was so young. Sure. Yeah. They saw me and they just protected me. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't have a normal like experience with siblings. Yeah. They were like my best friends. I call them my human shields. Like it genuinely felt like I was like this little person and like three people were just like hovering around me and shielding me from all the things I don't even know that they, you know, protected me from. Yeah. So it was hard even moving away because I remembered like moving to Paris and only originally going for a few weeks and then staying. I remembered FaceTiming one of my brothers or Skyping. I don't think FaceTime was as big then. And we like had a glass of wine together and it was like really hard because I was like, man, I'm so far away from you guys. I studied abroad in Italy 
And I'm really grateful for it, but it was incredibly lonely in a way that I nurtured, though. I liked yeah, that feeling. I loved it. It was the literal best feeling. I knew that, like, I knew nothing and I had everything to learn and that nothing was off limits to me because I just decided it was the craziest feeling. I just felt so alive and so in control of my life that I genuinely believed that there was nothing that was too difficult for me to figure out and just make it work. And that really was like the start of me just doing that for the rest of my life. Forever, it was like out of necessity and out of like just surviving. And it was like, I finally got to use all these things that I was doing on a daily basis, like making the best case scenario out of things, making sure I had enough resource, staying positive, working really hard. Like Now I'm using them because I want to be and because it's like benefiting me. I'm not just playing catch up with these survival skills. And I got to do it for fun. It was a really powerful kind of shift in my life. Hi, Lacey. Hi, Anna. I'm here with Elise Myers, who is just lovely. Oh, it's wonderful to meet you both. Hi, guys. Hi. Lacey, thank you for your really compelling letter. Oh, uh, thank you guys for taking the time to read it. Yeah, I have a lot of questions and it feels like a complicated issue. Will you tell us what's going on? Absolutely. I've been with my husband almost nine years now. We actually just celebrated our third wedding anniversary last week. He's a dream come true, the most wonderful, caring, loving, supportive man. We have an 11-month-old son. I couldn't ask for a better man for my son and for me too. Like our relationship, I feel, is super strong. However, I noticed early on in our dating that he seems to struggle with like, at first I thought it was white lies. And then it almost seemed like he was compulsively lying. And for the most part, it's not really with me. I overhear in small talk. He works from home, so when he's in um, meetings for work, almost to relate to another person, he'll make up a story in relation to what they're telling him. And I know it's a lot of it is fabricated. When we first started dating, he had told me, because we were discussing past relationships, and I was confiding in him that I had trust issues. I don't think I mentioned better, but I was catfished for six years <laughs> prior to meeting him. Oh, wow. Yes. And I actually had found out that I was being catfished a year into dating my now husband because I had cut off contact with that person. And then I had suspicions and then found out a year into dating my husband that this other person wasn't a real person. I wound up being a female and there was a whole thing there. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry because that's a lot of love you were giving. Yes. My husband said the same thing, actually, because I was really embarrassed and I had gotten over the emotional attachment to that person, but it was still a shock because I had given so much of myself emotionally to this person. But my husband said, you know, this is okay. You know, this shows your capacity to love somebody and just how much you really put everything into a relationship. So he wasn't shaming me for what happened. I've since moved on from that. We resolved things about that in about 2015. Good. Now back to the lying thing. It just shocked me because I had shared a lot of that stuff with my husband. And one of the first stories he told me about a previous relationship he had was that he dated a girl who ended up passing away. And that was like his one true love. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is so horrible. I'm so sorry. And I really like was there for him when he was telling me about that. And then time went on in our relationship and we have a lot of friends in common. Actually, two of my very best friends had known him prior to me knowing him. So it's a very small world that we ended up meeting. And they told me, you know, we never really saw him date too much. The girl that you're mentioning, I don't remember that girl ever being in his life, but maybe ask his family, you know, things like that. And so I kind of would tiptoe around finding out things through his sister did your husband give this person a name? Yes. So he called her Amber and he just said he dated her for about a year. She got ill and she died. And, you know, I was like, gosh, that is so horrible. I'm so sorry. Then as time went on in our relationship, I did bring up Amber a couple of years down the road. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, the girlfriend you had who passed away. And he's like, what? Oh, boy. And I'm like, yeah, you told me that like a couple of months. And he's like, I did. Like he was completely taken aback. 
because when this happened, I had shared this with my mother and my best friend. So it's a big deal. So yeah, come to find out he had lied about that. And then, you know, just white lies throughout there. And when it comes to our relationship, I have a very strong relationship and bond with him. We love each other very much. I do trust him. He's always treated me so well. He's so wonderful to my son. The way you describe it, it sounds like he lies kind of to form connection. Yes. So I looked into compulsive lying. I don't know much about it. I'm not a liar myself, especially given my experience. But when I started to put the pieces together that, hey, maybe he's not even realizing he's doing this. I had confided in my best friend who said she knew a friend of hers who struggled severely with compulsive lying. And she's like, that might be worth looking into. Have you asked him about it? And uh, about a year and a half ago, I brought it up. And he's like, oh, yeah, I mean, I guess I white lie. But he didn't think anything of it. But for me, it still bothers me because in our day-to-day lives or when we're interacting with other people, someone will be sharing something about their life and he has to pull something out of the air to relate to them. And I'm like, I don't think that happened. Did he spend a lot of time alone as a kid? Yes. His family is very religious. They are LDS. A husband, as his mother would put it, has fallen off the path. We don't really go to church. We believe in God, but through growing up in that church, he's learned a lot about himself and things he doesn't agree with and things that don't align with him, but he loves his family. And he's like, if this makes you happy, do it, but I'm not going to follow that anymore. And he's always been the black sheep of his family. He's always been the outcast. He's always had to kind of entertain himself and do things on his own. He's one of five children, as am I. My family life is a little different than his, but we do bond on that. You know, we're the outcasts of our family. And so I wonder if it has anything to do with his upbringing. His mother, I can see why he would feel the need to lie because his mother is a lot to deal with. Yeah, he's like shape-shifting. Yes. I thought it was really interesting when you said that it's almost like he lies to relate to other people. Yes. It's like he's lying with empathetic intention. Yes, and it's funny you said that because he describes himself as an empathetic person. Like when it comes to our relationship, our family, our kid, he is, but without other people, he says it's hard for him to connect with people empathetically. And so I wrote to you because I'm like, I don't know how common this is. This is very interesting because I fully love my husband and I'm willing to like say, hey, should we try therapy? I don't know. I think that that's what makes this so kind of beautifully unusual, I think, is that your relationship is so strong and that you believe in that. So when you overhear him making up a lie, like on a meeting or something, I had COVID five times as well, whatever. Yes. Yeah. That's a good example because I feel like he would say something like that. How does it make you feel? In the moment, I get a little annoyed and I kind of roll my eyes, like say I'm in the kitchen making food for our son and I could hear him down the hall and he's relating to somebody and saying a random lie about how he lived in Alaska. And I'm like, you've never lived in Alaska. (laughs) Like, you know, things like that. Can I ask, what did he say when you brought it up to him? Like, did he say like, yeah, maybe this is an issue? Or did he kind of just acknowledge that he does it? Yes, he kind of did. But then we swept it under the rug quickly. I'm a very non-confrontational person. So, you know, I just kind of brought it up like, hey, are you aware that you do this? And he's like, I mean, I guess I do. But when I do bring up past lies that I've overheard, he'll be like, I never said that. I'm like, oh, but you did. (laughs) Does he believe you when you say that he said it? Yes, he will. But at first, the initial reaction is almost defensive or like confused. I think he sometimes either doesn't remember or it's embarrassing. Other people people in his life must pick up on this, right? Yes. I really wanted to talk to his sister. He's very close with one of his sisters. And it's very hard because they live out of state. And then I also feel bad. I have guilt. You know, when I wrote to you guys, I'm like, if I go through with speaking with you guys, I have a little guilt, like I'm talking about my husband and I don't want to paint him in a bad light. But this is just bizarre to me and concerning. And it is one of my bigger issues. I don't like lying. So have you suggested to go to therapy with him? So we actually, during COVID, we went to couples counseling together and then also separately to address just separate subjects. And we never really got to discussing that because then we had our son and finances changed. And unfortunately, we're not in a position to get back into therapy. He has a good friend who used to kind of point fun at him and make jokes about how my husband lies or like, oh, you can't trust that one. And like he would bring up instances where my husband has lied to him and he's been called out and embarrassed by friends for it. So I feel like people that are close to him are aware. When he lies to his coworkers, is it competitive? Like, does he like to one-up people's stories? 
I do feel that way. He does have that about him and like more social and work settings. I feel like with peers, not so much with family and when he's with people he's most comfortable with. That's hard in a job. It is. And, you know, he's a hard worker, all that. It's just when it comes to the relating to people around him, it's like, I don't know where it comes from. But what about like his solitude? Does he enjoy being alone? I think so. I think he's very content with being alone. We feel the same way. Elise and I do. Yeah. <laughs> I as well. I need time alone to kind of decompress. And sometimes I'm like, I just want to be a potato on the couch and not have to deal with all the extra noise. The only thing that troubles me, because at first when we were talking about the idea of being an empathetic liar, I was like, man, he should take a creative writing class. His imagination is great. He understands character and people. And maybe that's an outlet to define his story. I agree. What you're saying is resonating because he is a very brilliant, creative person. He loves to write. He writes poetry. He hasn't been able to take the time in a while because, like I said, we have an 11-month-old son. And he is very hands-on some days, even more so than I am with our son. But it is something I've actually discussed with him in the past. Like, I think you should really, you know, go back to college and take some courses in writing because he's talked about how he wants to write a book someday. So that's really interesting you brought that up. Does he know you're talking to us? No. Will he hear this in the podcast? I don't think so. He is aware of the podcast, but on his own, I don't know that he'll like randomly choose, you know, this episode. Right, sure. I am very conflicted on if I want to bring this up to him that I'm speaking to you. That is something I'm struggling with. Here's what I wonder. You know how memory, we remember our sharp stories and they usually are off. Like, you know, if four family members of mine talked about the same incident, I'm sure it would all play out differently. Yes. But it is kind of tied to how we define ourselves. And I wonder how much he embellishes his childhood with events that never happened. He does. Yeah. It's almost like he's searching for his story. I think so. The thing is, I don't know how much harm his stories cause. They seem relatively innocuous, at least the ones we've heard, but I imagine that they leave you feeling a little isolated and confused. Yeah. And he probably feels really guilty about it and clearly sometimes unaware and probably embarrassed when he gets caught. Yeah. But I think maybe talking to his sister a little bit about it and having some kind of gentle approach. I don't want you guys having to rehash like the minutia from the past that you guys feel like you're over. Mm -hmm. And also you can call her like, I wouldn't do it at all in person around him. Yeah. Okay. Only because he would feel like you're talking about him. You are, but I would tell him that you're talking to his sister as well. I'm careful because we're talking about someone that isn't here, that doesn't know, you know, that you feel this way. Yes. Exactly. I would be very clear with him if this were me that like, hey, this is something I'm struggling with. And so I would love to talk to somebody else that maybe has been around it. Not that it's like you're a problem that needs to be solved, but there are problems or things that could be problematic with this like pattern that might continue and chat with his sister and let him know so that he doesn't feel like he's being talked about without him being in the room. Because he genuinely, if you bring that up and say, hey, I'm going to call your sister and we're just going to like chat for a little bit. I want to let you know. He might understand the urgency with which you feel that this needs to be fixed yes. or figured out. And he might understand like, maybe I don't feel like this is a problem, but clearly my wife wants to learn more about it. And yes. so he might take initiative if you decide to kind of let him in the know a bit more about it. How would that kind of communication sound? I think he'd be open to it. I am just nervous about the conversation. I don't want him to feel like I'm attacking his character or anything about him. I don't want him to feel defensive that I'm even bringing this up again, but it is something that's clearly still happening. You know, not every single day, but it'll happen a couple times a month where I'm like, okay, what is this about? And my friends have picked up on it too. So much so that like our close group of friends can kind of tell when he's bullshitting essentially. And they're just like, what was that about? You know? Yeah. And it's conceivable that down the road, this could even jeopardize one of those friendships if it hasn't already. Yeah. Elise, you look like you're hesitating. I think that if everything was as happy as you want it to be, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Okay. I think that there is a part of you that might find this to be more of a problem than it might seem. I think that like at the end of the day, compulsive, not compulsive, white lie or not, 
you need somebody to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. The biggest quality of my husband that I've said many times to many people is like, he does what he says he's going to do and he is who he says he is and he's home when he says he's going to be home. And that's like the foundation of everything, like our whole relationship. Yes, my husband is the same way. Yes, I think that like, if you can't trust every word that comes out of his mouth, that's a big deal, mm -hmm. especially as you raise another person. Yeah. You want them to be like your partner. You want your son to be somebody that tells the truth, that yeah. really values that, that can give someone his word and they can take it as like the truth. And so while the lies that he's telling might not make a lot of difference in your immediate reality right now, this is literally giving your son uh, permission yeah. that yeah. this is okay. He's going to be confused. Mm -hmm. You don't want that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like a healthy marriage and a happy marriage, it's not happy if you can't trust the person. Right. It might be simple and it might be like painless and you can get through the day and you love being around this person. Like I'm not taking any of that away. It's like you love him so much that you want this to be the best it can be. Mm -hmm. And the best time to do that is when you feel it and not wait another year and a half when like this resentment has grown and your son is a year and a half older, like I would definitely treat it as something that we need to work on this together, but also it's his thing. This is not yours to fix in him. Like you reach out to people that can support you and like his family and his sister, tell him so that he doesn't feel like you're going around his back. Mm -hmm. But then giving him the responsibility. It's not your job to keep track of the lies he's telling. It's not your job to make him feel like it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's your job to support him while he figures it out. I just feel like during this call, you've felt like it's your responsibility to make it better. And it's not. This is a thing that he's doing. You are so right, Elise. I really appreciate you saying that. I grew up in an environment that was not honest, and I have never, ever, ever been able to trust my memory of situations. And from the moment I became aware of, like, I can change that for myself moving forward, I have valued people telling the truth so deeply. And so I am the worst person to talk to about this question because my mercy for the situation is so much lower than it probably would be if you talk to somebody else. But I am very passionate about you creating an environment in your home, as well as knowing your history history that you can trust yes. what's happening around you. And I think that it's not like, oh my God, like this is the worst thing ever, yeah. but it is something that deserves to be addressed together. Yeah. That's kind of where my mind has been lately about this, especially since having our son. I think before it was easier to sweep these things under the rug and you bring up very good points in regards to our son. I don't want him to do that. Raising a kid is me and my husband have a year and a half, or he'll be two really soon. Mm -hmm. And it's everything that we struggled with before or everything that we have like decided to just not address within our personal selves, like has been magnified so much from like lack of sleep, stress, not enough time to recover emotionally, you know, like you get in a fight and go right back into it. You're like, you mm -hmm. don't have time to like tag out, you know, you're in it together. But yeah, if there's anything that will encourage you to just make it the best case scenario in every way. It's your son. Yes. He deserves that of both of his parents and you as well. Like, I'm sure there's all the things we could just be focusing on and refining and healing. And so I think that that would be great for you guys to focus on together and then also hand him the responsibility of it being like, yeah. even though you don't understand you're doing it, you are. So let's get some help in whatever way. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I'm trying not to cry, but yes. I would have been like, have him write a novella. Bye. <laughs> 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 but I do think that that would be a good outlet for him oh, as yeah. well, Anna. I do appreciate what both of you are saying, and that's why I'm here. I think Elise's advice is just brilliant in so many ways. Like, this isn't on you, Lacey. And that's something I need to work on within myself, too, while he works through this. It's hard. Yes. <laughs> You're taking this on because you love him. Like, this is why we're having this conversation right now. And so, trust me, if I could fix all of the things in my husband that he struggles with, that, like, he wants to fix and is having a hard time doing it, like, I would do it all. I love him so much. I'm like, let me just fucking put that on my back. Yes. <laughs> but that doesn't help them because they have to be the one to decide that, like, that's something that they fight to fix. 
So you can be there and like raise his arms and like hold his arms up when they get heavy, but you can't be his arms. He has to be his arms. And so that's kind of the image you kind of have to go into that situation with. Yeah. And the healthiest one, because that's what's going to keep both of you healthy in that and growing together and not like abdicating responsibility where it's yours to take. This is a lot to take in, but I, I know. seriously appreciate all of this. It's making me emotional because I care so much. I know. Yeah, and that's okay. Emotion is great. Yeah. We need to feel all of that. I do need to work on that, trying to take this as my responsibility to fix. But it is something that needs to be addressed. I can't keep ignoring it. Yeah. This must be a lifelong thing. I wonder that too, which is why I've been weighing the option of talking to his sister. And his sister is so wonderful and sweet and would be the best person out of his family to talk to about this. And genuinely, it doesn't have to be a very like accusatory or negative conversation. Like it can honestly be as simple and quick as like, have you noticed that Ryan doesn't tell the truth all the time? Like, have you noticed that? Or like, have you noticed that Ryan struggles with like honesty? Mm -hmm. It could be such a simple question. And if his sister just has never experienced that and this is new in his life, like you'll know right away. Yeah. And that's fine, you know, and it doesn't have to be this lengthy discussion. I just don't want you to feel like you're digging into something that it will bring a lot up right. because you also don't want to hear about his entire childhood of not telling the truth if that exists. Because also that's just like a lot for you to take on too. But like, it would be good to know, just like touch base and keep it real simple. Exactly. I agree with you. And I think I should probably make it a phone call and I will bring it to him probably soon. It's just, I really just needed to kind of get it out loud because it's been something I've been dealing with alone. Yeah. After hearing what Elise has been saying, I'm hoping that all of this will actually bring you and your husband closer. Like maybe he'll share more about his childhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're comfortable asking his sister things. And questions to him too. Like when you are in the moment and he does say something that isn't true, not being afraid or waiting, like it could be neutral, like a neutral question of like, what was that? Or like, yeah. why did you say that? Or like, where did that story come from? Yeah. And make it a pattern of like, every time you see it, he is verbally hearing with his ears, his story that he says out loud. Like sometimes that brain connection just needs to happen. Yeah. I think the more that you do that in the moment, it will feel more gentle and it will also feel so repetitive that he will start to be aware of how often he's doing it if he's not aware of it, you know, yeah. which might help as well. I just wonder about that initial conversation. Like you probably normally don't confront him about much, right? If I do, it's like the very serious needs to address it immediately. However, I agree with Elise and the fact that I should bring it up when it happens. I mean, if he's in a meeting, I'll let him finish his meeting, but say, hey, I overheard you today chatting with Chad from whatever department and you brought up this story and what was that about? Can you tell me more about it? I think those are good ways to ask him questions without being accusatory. Yeah. Like, when did you do that? I've never heard that story. It seems compulsive or I really just feel like it's a lack of awareness that he's even doing it until it's brought up later. It's almost like he thinks his words aren't being heard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because people do clock that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think once we get over this hurdle, when he's willing to visit this or process these things and figure out why he does this, I think it's going to be good. And it'll take a lot off of me to feel like I need to fix it. But I don't want things to go on this way and just not address it. Yeah. Also, I just want to encourage you. I want you to know for you, like you can decide right now that this is not yours to fix. This isn't like you gather information, bring it to him, and then it's not yours to fix. This isn't yours to fix right now. This isn't your fault. He's a great husband and you have a great marriage and he's a great dad. You're a great mom. You're a great wife. This isn't your fault. This isn't yours to fix. This is because you love him and all the decisions that you're making for the situation are out of love. And so I don't ever want you to feel like if something happens where it wasn't the way you wanted to, or if he gets upset, that's also not your responsibility. He's allowed to respond however he would like to this situation. And like, he's allowed to feel all the things that you're feeling now that you've had time to process that he hasn't, right? So like, I just want you to understand there's a very clear line in the sand, whether you feel it or not right now of like, what is yours and what isn't yours to carry. So as much as you possibly can, just like repeating to yourself, like, this is out of love and this is not my burden to like shoulder. Yeah. Just moving forward, genuinely feeling that and like reflecting on that is going to be so important because the earlier you can decide to let go of that responsibility and hand it to him, 
the easier it's going to be to support him in it because you can't support and do it at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's like counterproductive. So you have to decide which one you're going to do and supporting is going to just be better long term, you know? Yeah. I just don't want you to walk away from this because I I know that if you're anything like me, I'd walk away and go like, oh my God, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. (laughs) You know, just feeling guilty. Like this is the right thing. And also you're doing this out of love. Yeah. And the faster you can bring it to him, the more he can get on the same page with you. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you so much, Lacey. When thinking about you. Just give you a hug. And nice to meet you both. Yeah. Good to meet you. Bye guys. God, you were fucking powerful. Oh, God. And so wise. I didn't want to overstep. I felt really guilty. No, I am so grateful that you were here for that call. I just, there's a very fine line between like, what's my platform and like, what's my space to talk and not. And I'm just very aware of that, especially as a guest on someone else's show. And it's like, I understand we all have different ways of handling life. And so I never want to make someone feel like guilty, you know, about something as I'm sharing advice. You were amazing and gave incredible hard advice, you know? Telling the truth is like one thing I just, it's a big deal to me. And so, yeah, I've cut a lot of people out of my life because I just couldn't trust what they said to me. And it's like, there's just not many things I'm not willing to like move past. I'm a very forgiving person, but the truth is really important to me. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah. I had somebody just, it was like everything that came out of his mouth was a lie. And it was my first genuine, like, break my heart, take it out of my chest, stomp on it, throw it in the garbage, light it on fire, walk away, come do it again. Like, that was my first experience in the real world with like falling in love with somebody and we never even dated. And it really rocked my ability to trust myself. Like I believed his lies so much that I stopped believing myself when I would feel that they were lies. It was just the most unnerving experience. And I dealt with a lot of that as a child. Like, you know, you asked me... (laughs) what happened with my parents? I don't know. Like I said, like every time I ask somebody what happened, I don't get the truth. And so there's no point. It's like, I did that my whole childhood. I'm not going to do that in my adult life. And if I notice that pattern in somebody, you're gone. I'm sorry. I don't have time to deal with that. That's a you issue. And I can't fix that in you. So I'm not going to keep fact checking you. I'm just going to move on with people in my life that I can trust. Are you referring to your best friend that I was listening to one of your stories in your podcast that you shared a first kiss with. No, no, no. He's an incredible human being. Oh my gosh, no way. This was like my after high school, like... Oh, the hard times, like 18, 19. Yes, it was like that. It wasn't protected with like parents around and friends around. Like it was truly the first time you could isolate yourself and be in a relationship and no one would know. Like, you can't do that really in high school. Maybe you can. I wasn't good at hiding things in my life like that. Why did you feel the need to hide it? He was a terrible person. Like, I was embarrassed. Yeah. And he hid me. Like, he would only, you know, talk to me when no one else was around. And then we would be with each other. And, you know, he would tell me one thing and then we would part ways and I wouldn't hear from him for six months. And then we'd get, it it just was like, (sighs) it was a nightmare. (laughs) And that's an age, too, where it's almost like you don't really, or at least maybe I didn't, have the capacity to form much of an opinion of who that person is, like, fully. Yeah. And I think that it was, I didn't have a great example of love. I didn't have anything to compare it to that was, like, the gold standard and I think that it would have been different if I would have had that like display, like the healthy display of love in my life, like either people around that are in a relationship that's healthy or in my house, like there just wasn't a lot of that. And so genuinely, I think to the core of me, I believed that that's like as good as it was going to get. And I learned very quickly later that that was not at all as good as it was going to get. And it was going to get amazing, (laughs) but you don't know until you experience that. And so, yeah, I think that it's just very important that that's modeled to kids as early as they possibly can have it modeled to them. Where were you in the world at that time? And why do you think you fell in love with him? 
I was still in California. It was before I moved to Paris and then after and then all in between. Oh, so Paris must have been like you were struggling with that whole pull too. Well, I left because I was mad at him. That takes strength. Well, it was like a big fuck you. I was like, well, if you're going to just go off and do things, I'm going to go off and do things. And I ended up finding myself and becoming an incredibly healthy person, but not on purpose. <laughs> like, it was like out of a response to somebody that didn't love themselves and didn't love me. And yeah, but it was kind of during that time I was working a lot. And yeah, it was very interesting. Why do you think that you fell in love with him, though? Oh, man, I don't know. It was this person that they were like this like vacuum, like took the air out of the room. So just creative and talented and problematic, like the perfect trope in like a movie, you know, so toxic, but like so specifically toxic and niche to what your brain wants. It felt like he was like made for me in the worst way. Everything I was insecure about, everything that I desperately needed, he could give me on a surface level, and then he would just take it away because he knew that. And it was like the needs I had were met for a moment, and that kept me needing that all the time, and he didn't love me, so he didn't want to give that all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. It was a nightmare. Like, Jonas and I were just talking about this, like, this guy, like, really broke something in me that Jonas still is hearing about to this day. And he's just accepted that, like, that's okay. He loves me. And, like, we are still actively healing those parts of me that got broken by this person, like, in marriage with a child in another state 10 years later. It's crazy. Did you have a relationship after him? Every relationship I had was, like, punctuated by him in every way. When was the last time he reached out to you? He's reached out a bunch, and I've just not. Oh. Yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the messed up thing is, I think he believes that he is the person I believed him to be in the best light. Oh, he misses your gaze. I believed in him so deeply. I believed this version of him that doesn't exist. Like, this is how I saw him. And he loved that I saw him as this healthy person that was incredible. I like worshiped him as a person. I don't know if he ever received that from anybody else, that like adoration. And that was when he would come back is when he's like, ah, I need a little bit more of that. But I think in his mind, he's like, I love Elise and I'm doing this for her. I'm like leaving because I'm not good. And then he'd miss me and come back. It was a very confusing and toxic mess. It was a mess. And it was intermeshed with all of my other things happening in my life. And like, it affected every relationship I had, you know? It's crazy. Like, talking about it feels like I am talking about another person, not me, going through that. It's wild. And it probably feels more recent than it is. Yeah, like, years, but yeah, it's so fresh. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a scar that will never go away, but will definitely fade. Yeah. Well, first of all, the last, like, breakup, who initiated it? I've broken up with every single person I've ever been with except this person we were talking about. So I initiated it. It was like the closest to marriage I had ever been. I had accepted that this like mystery person was going to just float in and out of my life forever until I got married. That's kind of like what it felt like. And the person before my husband now, incredible human being, I have not a bad thing to say about him. He just was like 95% it for me. And that 5%, I was like, I don't think this is my husband, but I have no reason to say that. You know what I mean? On paper, it was like, they were perfect. Yeah, that's amazing, though, that you went from there yeah. to a place where you are, like, wholly accepting the generosity of somebody's love. Oh, yeah. And so I broke up with that guy and started dating Jonas, like, six months-ish later. And then, yeah. What were you doing in Australia? I... I accidentally joined a church school and I didn't know I was doing that. Wow. Okay. And I haven't gained the courage to really talk much about it because I'm really embarrassed by it. And also like, it was a big thing in my life. It was very confusing. I thought I was going to a music school turned out to be a church. Then I really burned a lot of bridges moving there, like in my life, because I was unhappy. So I was like, well, I can't really leave. So I ended up just buying in, but always feeling uncomfortable. And then that was like three years of my life. Like it was very confusing. And I tried to just make it as much about music as I could. Did you feel like a fraud? I felt a lot of things. 
Part of me really loved feeling like, you know, with church stuff that you feel like you belong. I liked feeling like for the first time I had like a community of people. So that aspect, I was like, okay, I can get on board with that. But then a lot of the theology of it, I didn't agree with. But I also felt kind of tricked to where it was like, well, maybe I do. And then I would try and question it and it was messy. And then I ended up just going all in at one point and deciding like, maybe this is what I want. And it wasn't. It was very, very messy. But I ended up getting there because I thought it was a music school. I thought I was going to go and learn how to be a professional musician. (laughs) And I did not. (laughs) I joined a youth group when I was in high school because I had this massive crush on this guy who went to another school and I knew he went to the youth group, although he never showed up. Anyway, but I got kind of sucked in. It felt like a place because I didn't have that many friends at school the whole time. I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I couldn't believe the confidence that, like, the cool kids were leading off the group prayer with. And I was always looking around like, what am I supposed to do? Okay, what, wait, what, where is that? What's yeah. that thing called again? And I ended up going to Mexico with this youth group to build homes. Yep. I wouldn't hire me as a home builder. <laughs> The people living in those homes feel that way too. It's a classic (laughs) church, like go build a house really poorly, take a photo, post it on your Instagram. It's like, that's just the culture. I did it too. It's like, I look back and I just cringe. I just want to like go and buy people homes in Mexico and be like, I'm so sorry I did that. (laughs) But I, I started to really feel like the outsider. Like there was the same social hierarchy that there was at school. Yeah. Especially because I didn't know what was going on. Like, I remember, you know, one of the church leaders being like, hey, your parents don't really believe in God, right? And I'm like, no, no. So on one hand, I was like taken under a wing. Like my prayer partner in Mexico was the nurse. Everybody else got like their best friend. Perfect. I got the nurse. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, this is going to be the best for you, honestly. (laughs) Oh, man. And I hadn't examined it. And I felt like I was going through the motions and that everyone could tell. But I had a curiosity because there was an elation at times. You know, I guess. It's a very interesting thing because there's a lot of factors that go into it. Like religion and feeling like you are a part of this group of people. There's so many things that happen in your brain that want it to be good or want it to work or want to understand. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of emotion tied up into it because of the music. For me, it was like the reason I connected even remotely to it was the music was so good. I thought it was real because I was like, I'm feeling so moved by this music. And then I went to a concert and realized, oh, I feel this way about music, not like not what we're seeing, you know, and there's just so many factors to it. It's hard to explain. And then you might just make a decision of like, you know, this isn't really for me. And then you have to kind of unpack why you did it in the first place. It just feels like there's so much going on there. When you try and explore that with religion, it just feels very weighty in the weirdest way. Was Jonas a part? How did that happen? Yeah, so he was there at the same time as I was. And where is he from? Well, he kind of moved around a lot as a kid, but he kind of claims he's from Kansas. He moved there when he was in like junior high, I think, and did a lot of his like formative years there. So he's from Kansas and went to the school for the ministry school And we met there. And then that's why we moved to Nebraska was he got a job in Nebraska at a church. And so we were just dating long distance. I moved to Texas. He was here in Nebraska for the church job. And then I moved to Nebraska because he felt like he really wanted to be here. And so that's when I moved to Nebraska and tried to get a job at the church. And it was very messy and they didn't want that. And so I left completely And then he left completely. And now we are like the happiest we've been in a long time. That is awesome. Yeah. I think that for me, it's the church. It's the physical building. It's the services. It's that's what we left. Like there is a part of me that still is like figuring out the actual like relational aspect of me and this God that I'm trying to figure out. It's all separate. And I think that the moment I tell someone like, I don't go to church, like I left church, people can be like, oh, that sucks. You're going straight to hell. Like, it's just very interesting. We're just kind of figuring it out together for the first time in our whole lives. And that feels so great to be on the same page with your spouse because it's something that can really damage a relationship if you're not on the same page. Oh, completely. Yeah. So what instrument do you play? Well, so I started on viola. So I've played viola for like 16 years. 
And then everything else I've kind of figured out by ear. So like guitar and piano. Piano is definitely like necessity chords writing kind of style. Guitar, I've learned by ear how to do a lot of things that are very stylistic, which is very fun. And then I sing and I write music. And so all those have kind of just been a way to write the music and get it in a demo. (laughs) That's incredible. It's an intelligence level that I don't have. I don't believe that. Well, you just have to have the time to figure it out. But maybe I don't have enough passion towards it then too. (laughs) That's fair. Let's say your house is burning. What instrument do you grab? Guitar. Really? I was going to go with viola. No, viola is great. It's just not something I can express my emotion with. Guitar is like I can grab a guitar and I can sing and play with it. A viola is such a different instrument. It's like... First, you can't sing with it because your face is smashed up against the chin rest. But then it's so like community based. It's something that I spent so many years studying. And so it doesn't feel artistic to me anymore. It's like difficult to compose. Yeah, I never did it that way. I always read sheet music and played in a group and led whole sections. So it's not an art for me anymore as it is like a mechanical situation. But guitar, because I only did it by ear and have only poured my heart out with it by myself, that feels more personal and emotional to me. Are you good at learning languages? Like, did you pick up French pretty quickly? Yeah. If I use it, I spoke fluently for a while. Now I would have no clue what you're saying, but I am very good at learning languages because it's kind of like learning music to my brain. It categorizes it. That's what I wonder. Yeah. Are you good with directions? No. I really am asking this because I think there's a correlation without any proof. Sure. I'm very dyslexic. And so I have to see it and I have to be able to like map it out in my own mind. I'm not auditory in any way. So if you give me a list of things, I won't remember them. So I'm not good at those kinds of directions. No. But like maps, like do you have a good sense of where you are at any given time? Not really. You're proving my point. Really? What's your theory? (laughs) My theory is that it's stupid. It's stupid. My parents would be embarrassed. (laughs) But the idea that there's a correlation between people who are good at music, math, languages, the reason why my parents would be embarrassed is because they were always incredibly dismissive of the right brain, left brain mentality. It's not really like an opinion. It's kind of fact, isn't it? I don't want to get into it with them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're like, something that is the conversation's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. I think what annoys them is how it is such a simplification yeah. of how complex the brain is. The summation is I'm weirdly good at directions and maps. Like, I really enjoy maps. It's weird. That makes sense. You're like my husband. Jonas will spend, like, instead of social media, he's like spends his free time scrolling Zillow And he will like just look at a map and look at houses and stuff. And like genuinely every time he tries to explain to me like where one house is in correlation to the other that he just showed me, it's like my brain resets, hard reset. Every time I look at a map, I'm like, I've never seen one of these before. I also used to want to be a travel book writer. Oh, okay. Why did you stop doing that? Well, I never did it. I decided to be a spoof comedian instead. I mean, look where that got you. (laughs) I can't believe it. (laughs) So unfruitful. What a horrible decision. Elisa, I have a weird history and weird feelings about my label as a comedian. It was never a goal. I can relate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know, but you have a podcast titled The First Time I Realized I Was Funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have a label because like people have to know what you're called, right? You have to have a title in some way. And like every time I'm introduced as a comedian, I just feel like a liar. (laughs) I mean, he'd be like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, why do I feel that? It's just so bizarre. But yeah, no, this was never my intention. And here we are. And I'm so grateful. Elise, what advice would you give to like somebody who is either pregnant or a new mom? Oh, gosh. Immediately, my first thought is understand what postpartum like depression and postpartum anxiety is. And don't ever be afraid to like say out loud the things that you're thinking Because the moment you are too afraid to say the things out loud, they become just such real feelings. And I wasn't taught the difference between regular anxiety and depression and postpartum. And it really messed me up for a really long time. And it was really bad. And I know that's so negative. Literally all of my answers are negative. I'm so sorry. No, it's so important. No one had talked to me about it. I didn't think it would happen. Like, yeah, this is important. Yeah. I think too, like there was so many wild thoughts that were intrusive that came in my brain that I was like, if 
I said these out loud, someone would come in and like take my baby away because you don't understand they're not you. They genuinely like float out from space and like enter your brain. And then it's your burden to carry that thought around. And it's like, just say it out loud. Have you been told really good advice? So the best piece of advice recently that I've been clinging on to that I've talked a little bit about in other places, but my husband just likes to tell me, um, just keep hitting singles. It's from the movie Moneyball that he loves, but it's really affected my life in a huge way. I am somebody that when I tackle something, I want it to be the best thing I've ever done. And I want it to be better than the last thing I did. And if it's anything short of that, I feel like it's a waste of time and I've failed. And that really affects my self-confidence and my drive to move forward to the next thing and to do things just because I love them. And so my husband is like, just keep hitting singles. Like it might not be better than the last thing you did and it might not be the best thing you've ever done. But if you love it and you want to do it, like hit a single and then move on. And that's been a very, very powerful piece of advice for me. And the fact that I have that coming from my closest person in my life is a huge deal. And he grounds me in that every day because I will go home at the end of the day and explain all the things I did. And I'll be very sad that <laughs> that I didn't do enough. And uh, he's just like, number one, stop. Number two, like just keep hitting singles. And it's really, really great. Elise, you're amazing. I can't thank you enough. Oh my gosh. This has just been a delight. And you truly saved me with that collar. <laughs> No, I'm happy to be the bad guy. No, you weren't. No, okay. you were wise. Okay. You were really, really wise. Well, thank you. Thank you, Elise. This was really wonderful. Oh my gosh, of course. And congratulations on your success. You are an anomaly. Thank you so much. We're just doing it one day at a time. Just keep eating singles. 